Hey, JD here. Welcome to the Mead House. You know, over the past several years, we've watched over 125 episodes of mead making, education, information, and entertainment. More than 80 guests have stopped by the Mead House. Professional mead makers, medal winning home mead makers, competition organizers, experts on yeast, and honey specialists have all visited to share their knowledge. The Mead House has produced the home mead makers and brewers looking for a bit of inspiration and information from the many guests and discussions we have here at the house. You can help support the Mead House by joining the Mead House Keyholder Club on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com and search for the Mead House. There's also a link in the show notes. For as little as two bucks a month, you can become a Keyholder. We've teamed up with some great companies to provide thank you gifts for your support. So get on over to Patreon, join the Mead House Keyholder Club, and get your own set of keys to the Mead House. Hey, you can listen to the Mead House podcast with your favorite player and be sure to rate us five stars on iTunes or your favorite listening venue. The Mead House. Mead making entertainment you just don't want to miss. Hey, in 1946, when Ralph Gamber bought three beehives at a farm sale, his intention was to rekindle his childhood fascination with bees and sell his honey to the neighbors in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. He and his wife, Luella, were totally unaware that this modest purchase would evolve into the largest independent honey packaging business in the country. Creators of the first honey bear, Dutch Gold Honey is committed to providing the consumer with the same high quality honey that Ralph Gamber insisted on in 1946. Dutch Gold is a true source honey, which simply means that the honey can be traced all the way back to its source. That's a big thing in the honey uh, production, uh, you know, if you're buying honey. Uh, Offering a nice variety of honey and other products, Dutch Gold Honey products can be seen at DutchGoldHoney.com. Big time supporters of the 2019 Iron Bee. Hey, thank you, Dutch Gold, for your support. Hey, welcome to the Mead House, and thanks for listening to episode number 136. You know where to find us. We're always on iTunes, Stitcher, uh, Spotify, iHeart, uh, just a whole lot of other places. They're all listed on the front page of the website, meadhouse.com. Hey, the Mead House, it's produced for home meat makers and brewers just like you. Looking for a bit of inspiration and information from the many guests and discussions we have here at the house. Hey, talk to us. We're on Facebook and Twitter, both at The Mead House. Or you can email us at info at themeadhouse.com. Jeff and Ryan are both seated at the bar. So am I. My name is J.D. Webb in this episode. A while back, I did a couple of extensive interviews with Ash Fishbein from Sap House Meadery. In one of them, Ash talks about fundamentals, starting out with knowing the difference between cleaning and sanitizing. In this episode, we're going to spend some time with Jonathan Etley from Kraftmeister National Chemical and talk to him about just that. Oh, and by the way, he's also a home brewer as well. Hey, in segment two, Jeff's got some ideas on cleaning and sanitizing. He's got a few questions for us here at the bar. So uh, if we get to it, uh, this segment may run a little bit long. Jeff, no promises, my friend. And hey, Facebook friends, if we can come to you guys, I'll tell you what, this is where we try to answer a few questions from our friends out there in Facebook world with no formal expertise other than what we've experienced in our own brew house all that and more here at the meat house but first hey thanks to all the meat house key holders who help keep the meat house podcast free you too can become a meat house key holder take advantage of those two interviews that we put up with south house meadery and help support the show for as little as two bucks a month we got some great thank you gifts to send to you get on over to patreon.com search for the meat house or just click on the link in the show notes hey what are we drinking tonight you know, uh, I, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, guys, I talked about this scotch ale thing that I brag it, that I put together, and I was complaining, <laughs> uh, as old men do, I guess, uh, about, you know, how little scotch, uh, this peated malt that I, the smoky peat malt that I had put in it, I thought, well, it was a waste of time. Well, I take it all back. 
Okay, not really. Uh, apparently, you got to give this a little bit of time. Uh, I poured me uh, a glass of it tonight, and let me tell you, uh, this this is Ryan. This is right up your alley, my friend. And I can't wait to get a couple of bottles uh, bottled up for you guys when I come up to uh, Minnesota next month. Uh, this is outstanding. I'm digging this. Okay, if you're a Scotch drinker. Uh, you're going to love this stuff. I mean, that smoky, peaty malt kind of uh, comes through on the mid palate a little bit. You get a little whiff of it but up front. Uh, I mean, this is, this is really outstanding. I'm digging it. In my other fist in Mead House tradition, something new that I found from Basil Hayden, Ryan. Uh, might even bring you a bottle. This is Caribbean Reserve Rye. Now, this is a mm. limited production, okay? Uh, now, uh, this is a, this it's sweet. Uh, it's very sweet. Uh, this is one of those after dinner things. Uh, enjoy after a nice big, big red meat meal, maybe. Um, mm, I love this stuff. Now, let me tell you something. If you're a fan of Cruzan Blackstrap Rum, you're going to love this Basil Hayden Caribbean Rye. Now, this wasn't aged in rum barrels. This is actually a blend with a blackstrap rum. And I tell you, it is outstanding. My wife loves it. In fact, we had to go back to Costco and buy five or six more bottles of it because we discovered that it's a limited release. So no telling how long it's going to be on the shelf. <laughs> Jeff, uh, you're always good for something really fantastic in your glass. What is it tonight? So, as Meat House tradition dictates, I am indeed double fisting it tonight. Um, tonight, I am doing a little bit of research. I have talked about my intention to make a um, a s'mores braggot. Yes. And uh, I got to the homebrew store. Um, I was kind of looking at my options, weighing out my grain bill and things like that, and went, you know, what the heck am I using for a stout base? Mm. You know, there are more than one variety. You know, you got that classic uh, Dublin dry like a Guinness. You've got oatmeal stout. you got milk stout. And it occurred to me that I had put a lot of thought into what I was going to do in secondary, but not a lot of what I was going to do in primary. So tonight, I'm doing a little bit of research on that front. I grabbed myself a uh, can of Dragon's Milk White, which is a white stout. Um, in, oh, wow. you know, Dragon's Milk tradition, it is bourbon barrel aged, which... You know, it's not as overt as the, the classic dragon's milk, which we all know and love. Um, but the, the bourbon is there. It's light-ish. It's smooth-ish. Um, very smooth. The body is really present, of course, because it is a stout. And um, this is becoming a strong contender for the base. Wow. My, uh, my other fist has uh, Left Hand Brewing Company's Milk Stout on Nitro. And their Milk Stout on Nitro is a... A, a real favorite of mine as well. Um, the nitro makes it nice and smooth. It doesn't have that kind of a um, the, the carbonated bite of CO2 to it. Um, you get some of that uh, the roasty, chocolatey kind of character that you, you're used to in a stout. Uh, the body is definitely very full. So you know, this, is, this might be a case of I'm going to take what I like from one and I'm going to take what I like from the other. And I'm not going to make it a... a uh, true to style one way or the other stout based for my bracket um so we're kind of we're gonna we're gonna play around the peak sounds good that's you know my wife's favorite beer is is the dark beers the stouts and the porters so uh mm -hmm. you know as soon as you get it brewed up send a bottle to her she'll tell you if she likes it or not <laughs> <laughs> hey ryan uh, you know, you, you got some experiments going on. You're blending last week. It was a blend of something or other that you put in your glass. Uh, always something different. What is it tonight, bud? Uh, yeah, a little more boring tonight. I didn't, didn't do any <laughs> blending. I pulled, and I'm going to keep this real short tonight uh, so we can get into it, but I am uh, drinking a mixed fermentation mead and the reason that i reached for a bottle of this mixed fermentation mead which which is actually really nice is because of our our guest tonight and the very first time i had a 
mixed fermentation brew happen, you know, early in my brewing career, it was unintentional. <laughs> so something happened along the way that uh, had some had some uh, Brett or some bugs get involved, and and I thought, you know what, it kind of as an ode to that, I am going to uh, pull out one of these tonight and drink it, and see if that um, plays into any of our conversation uh, with our with our featured guest this evening. You know, if you're familiar, uh, if you're familiar with the uh, Bob Ross joy of painting. It was always a happy accident, right? We we don't make mistakes. We just have happy accidents. Oh, <laughs> good stuff, yeah, Ryan. Well, Go ahead. Sure. So that's so the guy that claims this- he's cleaning out Lily's gutters. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, Ryan. happy little trees too. Yeah. All right. Um, Jonathan is a brewing ambassador and key accounts manager for National Chemical. Uh, He has an education, his education is a a BA in cognitive neuroscience and an associate's degree in culinary, uh, culinary arts. He spent 10 years in in a fine dining kitchen. You know, we, we talk so much about how to pair you know, meads with foods and, uh, right. uh, you know, all the flavors and things like that. I mean, I think Michelin should start giving stars for, for <laughs> our, some of our meads, especially, yeah. uh, s'mores <laughs> mead. And, yeah. and, uh, I figure my, my bananas foster brag. It's at least a two Michelin star, at least. <laughs> you know, endeavor here uh a home brewer since 2001 he's a member of the beer barons of milwaukee they've got a very good mead maker down there i know about and uh is the siebel in the siebel institute draft master certified jonathan welcome to the mead house and what's in your cup tonight hey thanks for having me guys i uh, appreciate the time spent here and uh being from uh, Wisconsin, I am enjoying a New Glarus No Coast Moon Man Pale Ale. It's, uh, it's, I was in it's, Wisconsin. That's where my uh, cabin is. I was in Wisconsin last week, and really? was we were drinking New Glarus, of course, the the Spotted Cow. But then uh, also reached for some Bubbler. I I do enjoy that one as well. Sure. Yeah, Which and I uh, believe is their spontaneously fermented uh, beer. Yes, they um, have a brand new modern brew house for their regular fermentations, and the old brew house, in addition to some caves, are used for uh, spontaneous and wild fermentations. That's basically Dan Carey's playground. Um, so they kind of yeah. keep the the spontaneous and wild fermentations in a totally separate facility from their regular fermentations, like. Spotted Cow and Moon Man, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, it's kind of our, our gem in Wisconsin here. Absolutely. That's, a, that's an only available in Wisconsin brewery. So if, you're, if you pass through Wisconsin or if you get close, make sure to pick some up. But uh, it's, it's one, of the, one of the great breweries in the country. Yeah, definitely. And uh, – also one of the cleanest breweries I've ever had the chance to visit. I mean, uh, I felt like I could eat something off the floor there. It was so spotless. Uh, it's just a fantastic facility in New Glarus. Excellent. Well, Jonathan, we've got a bunch of questions for you, and and I'd love to Great. dive right in. Does that, that sound okay? Oh, I, I love answering questions. That's all I do. Just fire away. <laughs> so I think we're going to start kind of basic here and then work our way up a little bit. Uh, okay. One of the most basic ones we get, especially from new brewers and new mead makers, is uh, they they sometimes use terms, sometimes interchangeably, sometimes they don't know the difference, sometimes uh, they're just they're just asking because they don't know. And mm-hmm. some of these terms that they'll throw out onto forums or, or ask questions about are cleaning, sanitizing, disinfecting, sterilizing. Uh, could you kind of help us unpack some of these terms and into what they mean uh, to us, you know, uh, mead makers and brewers? Oh, absolutely. I think that's a great place to start. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I did work for quite a while in retail in the homebrew industry for 
uh, Northern Brewer back when they were kind of the original Northern Brewer uh, from 2009 to 2013. And that, that uh, honestly, a set of questions I got almost on a daily basis um, for retail troubleshooting. And that's carried over into what I do for National Chemicals now, too, where I, I, I work directly for a manufacturer representing a product line for cleaning and sanitizing. So kind of the place to start is um, cleaning. Cleaning is the thing that happens first. You can't sanitize something that's dirty. What clean means is you physically remove visible dirt and debris from the surface that you're working on, say to the inside of a carboy or a bucket or a keg or a bottle, and you can clean with a variety of things. Most commonly, you're going to clean with a detergent and possibly a brush if you need one. Uh, and as, uh, as far as my product line, uh, you would use some of the cleaners that we make under the Kraftmeister brand name, such as our oxygen brewery wash or alkaline brewery wash to make a effective cleaning solution to help break down the physical dirt and debris left over from stuff like fermentation or beer brewing or um, uh, you know, even dust on new equipment needs to be cleaned off. Now, once you've cleaned and removed the physical dirt and debris, you rinse away all that junk and the, the cleaning solution. You rinse well to remove the detergent, and then you can apply a sanitizer. Now, in our home brewing world, sanitizing is done with chemicals. And um, if for national chemicals, our sanitizer of choice for home fermentation is uh, BTF iodophore. It's an iodine-based sanitizer. Uh, it's very easy to use, very gentle on your skin and hands. Um, iodine uh, will basically uh, kill any type of microbes on the inside of that surface, um, uh, such as uh, bacteria, wild yeast, mold, uh, fungus, bacteria, viruses, etc. Um, now, sanitize, what that means on a technical level is that you are uh, killing 99.9% .9 of uh, microbes on that surface in five minutes or less of contact time. So you'll notice that there's still a little bit hanging out there in sanitize. And the next step further than that is disinfect. Now, disinfect means you're going a couple extra points on that scale down to 99.999%, and that's disinfected. So just that extra little step. And there's really not a need for people on the home hobby level to worry, worry about disinfecting. That's hospital-grade stuff. Um, and if you go a step beyond disinfect, it's sterile. Sterile means there's no life present. And a, a home brewer is never really going to get to the level of being sterile. Um, uh, sterile is usually achieved by a combination of heat, steam, and pressure. Um, and, you know, say you're prepping something like, like a probe to go to Mars or something like that where you can't have any life on board there, that's sterile. Um, your buckets are never going to get sterile. Sanitize is perfectly fine. Great. Yeah, so so the home mead makers, the home brewers should worry about cleaning and sanitizing, you know, cleaning, removing all of the the debris, the the dust, the dirt, the the crust left over from your last brew, um, and then and then sanitizing with a chemical, uh, which which is removing ninety nine point nine percent of of any microbes on there, and we really don't need to worry about going beyond ninety nine point nine in home brewing or home mead making, uh, because the the risk of spoilage is at that point is, is non-existent or is, is virtually non-existent. Is that what you'd say? Uh, it basically, um, when you're about to begin a fermentation, you, you try to get a clean as slate as possible uh, so that you can inoculate your fermentation with your yeast or fermentation organism of choice, whether it's, you know, a sack yeast or a wine yeast, or, uh, uh, you know, if you're making a sour beer or mixed fermentation, you, you, you want to have as, um, an environment is free from bacteria and outside yeast and mold, besides what you want to be fermenting, your actual yeast culture. Once your yeast culture starts taking hold in that fermentation, it's going to outcompete anything that might be present there, even in that extra 99.9% .9 that may be left over. Um, and, and once that yeast takes off, um, you're, you're pretty much protected from uh, outside contaminants at that point.
Um, however, Great. you know, later on in the process, there also are still cleaning and sanitizing needs when uh, you're doing post fermentation uh, in the you know packaging, caking, bottling, etc. So um, there are still needs for sanitation post fermentation also. Uh, but I also think it's critical to get started on a clean slate. Um, so you, you you start your beverage off on a good foot. Okay. Uh, another common question we get uh, is people will ask why do they need to buy uh, cleaning? Let's just go cleaning for a second. Um, supplies, br- cleaning brewing supplies, or, or cleaning supplies from their from their uh, local homebrew shop, uh, and can they use the household cleaners that they have? Uh, in their home, you know, for, for their other sur- their household surface surfaces, excuse me. Um, that's a great question. Um, you know, there are a lot of people, um, you know, early on and throughout their brewing career that will use stuff like Dawn dish soap or, um, you know, OxyClean versatile unscented laundry detergent. Um, however, I always like to recommend you know, in the, in the instance of Dawn dish soap, um, uh, that's more of a degreasing agent that's designed to break down, fats from your dishes. Now, you're not really dealing with fatty soils in brewing, so it's not really the correct choice for cleaning your brewing equipment. Um, you know, OxyClean laundry detergent, there are some common ingredients there uh, between, uh, say, the sodium percarbonate, that ax- active oxygen OxyClean chemical um, that's featured in a, in a variety of home brewing cleaners, ours as well. Um, uh, so there are some commonalities between OxyClean and brewing detergents, but with laundry detergents, um, you're dealing with things that, you know, may be flaws for homebrew cleaning, uh, such as they don't rinse away very well. You've got to rinse and rinse and rinse and rinse to remove all this um, potentially chalky haze and residues because, you know, quite honestly, laundry soap's not really meant for doing dishes and cleaning carboys and brew kettles. Um, dedicated brewing detergents, uh, such as our Kraft Meister detergents, or even my competing products, say from Five Star or One Step, Be Bright, et cetera. These are detergents that have been specifically designed to dissolve quickly, clean rapidly, rinse away readily, uh, usable in moderate water temperatures. Uh, and so it's, it's an extension of using the proper tool for the job, basically. Great. Excellent. Um, you know, another common question that we see people ask, and it Actually, I want to go back a step because I this I just just popped into my mind. I did this early in my career. Uh, I I had some bottles that had labels on them, and I wanted to kind of uh, you know kind of loosen up those labels and 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 get them off the bottles. And I filled up a wash tub, you know, with with water and uh, baking soda. So just like your Arm and Hammer baking soda, and I let them mm-hmm. sit for a couple days and and most of the labels you know loosened or came off and some better than other but what i noticed was that the glass bottles that on the outside of the, you know that that at one point seemed really smooth had kind of a a rougher texture after soaking them in the in the baking soda is that what you're talking about by some of that that build up that can kind of occur if you're just if you're not using a uh, a brewing product? Um, it's certainly possible. I mean, um, when you're dealing with a brewing detergent, say, I'll, I'll, in, speaking of bottle labels in particular, our Kraftmeister Alkaline Brewery Wash is a mixture of um, at least 10, if not more, separate components all built into that powder. Um, and so not only you're dealing with the primary detergents like washing soda, uh, which is not really, it's sodium carbonate, not sodium bicarbonate, um, uh, but you also have um, you know, detergents, uh, pH alkaline builders, you have, uh, you know, rinse aids, surfactants, things that um, uh, not only protect the equipment that you're cleaning, uh, but also make them effective. Um, you'll find that uh, you probably would need to soak those bottles quite a bit shorter in a solution of the alkaline brewery wash as opposed to the straight baking soda. Um, you know, there's a chance that, um, uh, you know, sodium bicarb is not terribly reactive, but if it sits there for a couple of days, um, you know, there's a chance that maybe you're pitting or etching that glass over a long period of time. That That's possibly what happened there. Yeah. You know, yes, I, you mentioned your, your oxygen brewery wash is great for delabeling. 
uh, I've also used your Kagan Carboy cleaning tablets, and they, oh, yeah. those have done a good job of taking labels right off as well. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's another one of our cleaning products. It's a convenience product. It's pre-measured into tablets, uh, so you don't have to worry about spilling powders or counting scoops. Um, you know, I, I really like those later on in the brew day when I've uh, started cracking a couple of pints and I have a hard time counting <laughs> six for my scoops. It's easy to just drop in tablets instead, and uh, it uh, they, they they really are very handy, and um, uh, and they use a lot of the same chemicals that I've been talking about, uh, just uh, specifically designed to go into a tablet. And uh, um, if you have a couple of minutes, I wouldn't mind telling you the story about National Chemicals. Uh, I don't know where this fits in in the conversation, but we're an go, old company. Go, yeah, better. go ahead. We've been around since 1947. We're in our third generation of family ownership uh, located in Winona and Lewiston, Minnesota. Uh, so we are our own manufacturer. Um, in, in approximately the 1950s, uh, my boss's dad invested in some tablet presses. We actually manufacture our own tablets. And for a small company to have that versatility to design, manufacture, and produce our own tablets on a variety of scales allows us to make tablets like this Caden Carbon tablets and design our own formulas and press them out. Um, you know, over the years, we've done some pretty cool things in the, in the beverage industry. In, uh, in the mid-60s, uh, Dr. Chuck Landman, um, worked with Anheuser-Busch and Miller Coors, I'm sorry, it was just Coors, Coors and Anheuser-Busch, um, to develop the industry's first brewery-approved liquid caustic line cleaner, and that's our BLC, beverage system cleaner. Um, so we basically originated the liquid line cleaning industry and the caustic-based industry. Um, uh, in the early 70s, uh, when the EPA was established, I believe it was in the in the early 70s, uh, in the Nixon administration, when the EPA was established, yeah. uh, National Chemicals holds some of the oldest and original registrations for sanitizers with the EPA or for products that still exist now, like our BTF iodophore and our quaternary ammonia sanitizer with some of the original registrations filed at the federal EPA. Um, and those are products like our iodophore that are used for sanitizing at home now. Um, so we've got you know decades of expertise uh, and relationships in the beer and beverage and brewing industry from cleaning beverage systems to brew house sanitation to cleaning glassware. And that's why we love answering questions. And I love this format because uh, uh, we feel it's best to get these types of questions answered directly from a manufacturer that deals with this and has for over 70 years. Um, so it's, it's the best thing we can do, quite honestly. Can I? Great. Well, we we appreciate you being here and doing this. This is uh, one of some of the most popular questions that we feel, or some of the most cool. Yeah, some of the most numerous ones. So, uh, you know, the next question, and maybe it's not so much a question, but a but a statement people make um, is when they use a no rinse sanitizer. Yeah. They. Um, they get nervous. They, you know, whether it's the foaming kind or the non-foaming kind, they mm -hmm. they will say, "Well, I I just put chemicals into my my carboy or my bucket or my keg or my bottles, and and I don't want that in my mead." And so, you know, I feel like I should rinse it out with water, you know, after I've after I've just used a no rinse sanitizer because they don't want that that no rinse sanitizer in their mead. Um, Let's just say carboy or bucket for for sake of a, a place to start here. Um, mm -hmm. What? Uh, how do you respond to that? And I'm if, uh, I'm sure you may have heard that once or twice. Oh, it, it's a great thought, and it all starts. Um, it, uh, I'll reference back to that EPA registration. That EPA registration. Uh, every so often, you have to uh, go through what's called a data call, uh, where the EPA certifies your. Uh, concentration and time contact to kill a variety of bacterial cultures. And um, that concentration then becomes your usage rate. Uh, those usage rates are your guideline for measuring properly to ensure that you can actually have a no-rinse sanitizer. Now, any sanitizer uh, has those directions clearly stated on the package in terms of you know, X number of ounces per X number of gallons. You know, for our BTF iota 4, it's a half ounce of the concentrate for five gallons of water. 
Uh, it yields um, approximately 25 parts per million of available iodine. At that concentration, um, uh, actually, I apologize, it's 12 and a half parts per million at that concentration, a half ounce per five gallons. Um, uh, one ounce per gallon gets you 25 parts per million available. Now, in that, in that concentration, your uh, two minutes of contact time, you, you dump it out and air drip dry, and there is no need for a rinse after that. Now, if you go through and rinse after that, you run the risk of recontaminating your container that mm -hmm. you're fermenting in. And that could come from potentially the municipal water source. It could come from dirty crud on your faucet that, uh, that gets into the water that then gets into your carboy. So you're, you're practically chasing your tail if you rinse away and no rinse sanitizer. You almost have to do it again. Um, and uh, that's basically the case for any quote-unquote no rinse sanitizer that's out. So the other very common one that you guys are familiar with, I'm sure, is you know, Star Sand from Five Star Chemicals. And you know, their tech sheets lay out the same uh, proposition. There. It's, it's, it's you know, federally regulated stuff that comes down from the EPA that... Uh, if you overshoot the desired concentration, um, you'll need a rinse with clean water uh, because you're dealing with residual chemical that can potentially be undesirable at that point. Um, so it's important to not only follow the instructions, the contact time, the usage rates, the measurements um, to ensure that you can get that no rinse sanitizer. And not all, sanitize, not all products out there are truly sanitizers. I mean, the other one that comes to mind uh, from uh, the winemaker world is One Step. Uh, one Step is not really a sanitizer. That's not registered or regulated by the EPA. Um, it's a good cleaner, and you can be pretty certain that your surface is clean, but it's not technically a known sanitizer because uh, it doesn't have that fancy certification, regulation certification from the EPA. Okay, so... Like two two follow ups on that. Number one, so if 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 a half a teaspoon is recommended, three tablespoons is not better. Yeah, like that's right. Yeah, using more is not better. You're absolutely right. Yeah, especially with iodine. If you overshoot it, you can actually track iodine uh, that you can taste into your fermentation. And uh, I've evaluated yeah. beer where that's the case, and it's not pleasant. That if you use it correctly, good. that won't happen to you. That is good to know. That is, ab you know, that was one of my questions, Ryan. You beat me to it, dude. <laughs> and yeah. so use it in, in the recommended proportions. It's kind of like these manufacturers knew what they were saying when they told you the, the proportions to use it in. I guess they put, it and then, they put instructions on the bottle for a reason, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> if and, we don't, we get in trouble. <laughs> And then secondly, uh, you're saying that if you use it in those right proportions and you, you know, follow the, follow the procedures, there's going to be no noticeable taste uh, left over in your fermentation or, or anything like that. And, uh, and, and if you are tasting something, it really just means that you use too much of it. Uh, in the case of iodine sanitizers, you, you, you do need to yeah. air drip dry as much as possible. It doesn't have to be completely bone dry, uh, but that's part of the reason why, uh, if it is still a little bit residually wet, uh, you want to make sure that you're using the correct concentration. And once again, for, for a five-gallon batch, that's uh, a half ounce, which is a tablespoon for five gallons. All right, great. Um, another common thing we see are people who... You know, whether intentionally or unintentionally, do some sort of a, a sour fermentation or a mixed fermentation, whether they're using mm -hmm. Brett or Lacto or Pedio or, or something, you know, and uh, some sort of, of uh, bug. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, do they need to now dedicate all of that equipment to only doing sour fermentations? Or uh, can they uh, keep, can they clean that equipment uh, and sanitize that equipment and, can, and use it again if they want to do a clean fermentation? That's a, that's a very good question. And um, I you like know, the this ultimate guy. Every time the, I ask him a question, he says that's a good question. <laughs> those, are, those are great questions. <laughs> I mean, it's the nitty gritty of cleaning and sanitizing here. And, um, you know, the ultimate insurance policy is to have separate gear for 
clean and mixed fermentations. However, that's not always practical. Um, I find that it can be a little trickier to remove unintended bugs like la lacto, bread, PDO from food grade plastic buckets because those are slightly porous. Mm -hmm. However, once you start getting into harder surfaces like uh, you know HDPE plastic fermenters like Better Bottles or stainless steel or glass, um, if you clean that well and uh, you know clean with a good detergent like we were talking about before, rinse that out nicely. Um, there are two usage rates for the BTF iota for the standard everyday usage rate that we are certified to have a sanitizer solution for is that 12 and a half parts per million. That's the one ounce, uh, one tablespoon for five gallons. There is another usage rate for 25 parts per million uh, that uh, we put on there because uh, you know in, in the restaurant and institutional world, um, some places may call for a 25 parts per million solution, which is a full one ounce per five gallons. What I would suggest is if you have a glass carboy or stainless steel conical where you have some kind of mixed fermentation and you'd like to have a clean fermentation after that, I would make the 25 parts per million solution, the one ounce per five gallons, um, and the normal usage rate is two minutes. Uh, I usually recommend going about 10 minutes of soak time with the 25 ppm solution, mm -hmm. just to really give it a good amount of contact time. Uh, dump that out, let it air dry, and uh, you can be just about assured that the iodine is going to do its job. And iodine kills just about anything. I mean, it's certified to kill um, things that uh, anionic acid sanitizers like Starsan may have a hard time doing so. Uh, stuff like acetobacter, stuff like uh, yeast and wild yeast, uh, lactobacillus, pediococcus, uh, spore-forming bacteria, um, uh, anthrax, botulism, in case you made that killer beer, um, iodine uh, will kill just about anything, especially in that higher concentration. So what that means for you guys is you, if you accidentally made a sour beer in a glass carboy, you can salvage it by treating it properly with chemicals. Hell yeah. And I, I, know, I know people up and down that have done this, and it works just fine. People that own and run homebrew stores. They rubbed that iodine stuff all over my chest when I had my two heart surgeries, so it's got to be worth something. <laughs> <laughs> You're darn right it is. <laughs> this is good stuff, Ryan. Keep going, man. Yeah. Keep going. So I, I've got one more. I've got one more question uh, for Jonathan, and then I'm gonna throw it over to you guys, um, mm -hmm. JD and Jeff. Uh, and here's the last. Here's the last one that that we've seen uh, asked uh, numerous times. Um, some folks uh, pose the question or, or ponder that certain bugs can, uh, I don't know, I, I'm, I might be doing a little conjecture here, so we'll just, we'll just kind of kick in at the end here. But so that certain bugs can uh, develop a tolerance or have a tolerance to certain type of sanitizers. And so to be ultimately safe, um, you should switch up your sanitizers, or I guess to put another day, we've heard sanitizer, we've heard um, home mead makers say, oh, you know, for, for a month I use Star San, and then I switch it up, and then for a month I use Iota 4, and, and then for a month I use something else. Dude, and they're kind of on this, this sanitizer rotation. You're still on um, all my I'm questions. <laughs> yeah, and, and I'm, I'm conjecturing because they think that maybe one of them is not getting everything. Um, what about where should we? Uh, how should we think about that? Do, do, people, do you need to, to switch up? Is there any is there any benefit to switching up sanitizers, or is uh, is, is iodine or, or picking a good one going to be good forever? I mean, you could honestly go your entire brewing career using one sanitizer, and the vast majority of your batches are likely going to be perfectly fine. Now, I don't know if I have a completely certifiable answer that, yes, rotating sanitizers is a good thing to do. What I can say is it certainly doesn't hurt. And especially if you're uh, someone that's uh, been relying on star sand for a very long time, and you may have a lingering off flavor in your beer or meat or wine, uh, like say a band-aidy phenol kind of flavor that's typically caused by a wild yeast contamination. Um, in those instances, I think it's a great option to go through and wipe all your beer clean with iodine uh, and use a BTF iota for. 
And there may be certain applications where you want different sanitizers. Star Sand is habitual for foaming up like crazy. Um, uh, BTF Iodophore is a low foaming sanitizer. Uh, if you're running a sanitizer through a pump or a uh, uh, keg washer apparatus where you don't want a lot of foam generated, iodine may be a better choice for you. Um, if you are in an application where you want a lot of foam, star sand may be a better option for you. I don't think it's a bad idea to have multiple tools around for the sanitizing job. Um, and, uh, you know, if you want to uh, rotate back and forth every other month, you know, you know, say January star sand month and February's iota four month, more power to you. Uh, I think uh, your gear is probably going to be better for it. Uh, but once again, I don't know if that's, something I can back up with uh, a technical explanation. Um, but uh, as far as I know, there's a lot more research done on iodine and what it's capable of killing. Um, and iodine on a technical level works by uh, basically penetrating individual cell walls and preventing individual cells from synthesizing proteins, which generally means death in a very quick uh, fashion. Mm. Um, if you can't produce protein, you can't divide new cells, you can't live, basically. And that's what iodine does. Uh, so there's not really anything that's going to be terribly resistant to that. Well, excellent. Uh, Jeff, what do you, you have on your list? Sure. Um, so, you know, I, as a, uh, a home brewer, I, I kind of feel like in some cases I can be a little bit, I don't want to say lazy, but I try to simplify things. And I know mm. when it comes to cleaning stuff, you mentioned earlier that, you know, like the, the, uh, keg and carboy cleaner uh, tablets uh, were, mm -hmm. were really good at like removing labels, things like that. One of the mm -hmm. things that I find myself wondering, and I find myself trying more often than not, I'm not sure if this is a good thing or a bad thing, but you know, let's say I drop a tablet into a keg and carboy cleaner. Uh, I, I drop it into a full keg of hot water. Um, mm -hmm. I get it good and clean. And then am I able uh, to uh, just dump that into, let's say, like a bucket full of bottles that I want to get the labels off of? Um, is there a declining level of effectiveness to these products, whether it's like that one or the alkaline or oxygen-based cleaners? Um, would I need to keep the heat up to keep it effective? Or, um, you know, can, can we go into that a little bit? Because I find myself trying that, and I don't know if I'm doing things right, so to speak. Yeah, no, that's, um, that's something that uh, is a very good point of reference uh, to, to discuss. Um, now, on a, on, a, on a day where you're doing brewing activities, like a brew day or a packaging day, you're certainly able to mix up a solution of, say, the cake and carboy cleaning tablets or our oxygen brewery wash um, and have them be effective and usable for several hours. Now, um, detergent cleaning products that have the sodium percarbonate, which is the effervescent oxyclean chemical, quote-unquote, um, mm -hmm. those type of cleaners are generally going to require warm to hot water, about 100 to 120 degrees plus, to be completely effective okay. and to dissolve and activate that sodium percarbonate. So that includes our cake and carboy cleaning tablets, our oxygen brewery wash. Uh, now, after about 60 to 90 minutes, a lot of that oxygen is kind of faded out, and you still have a backbone of a good workhorse alkaline detergent and sodium metasilicate there. That's going to clean quite a bit of things for you. But if you okay. consider about, you know, 30 to 50% of that powder by weight is sodium percarbonate, and it's really gone after 60 to 90 minutes, it's not nearly as strong after a few hours as when you initially mix it up. You know what I mean? Now, yeah. if you're someone that wants to have a cleaner around for hours and hours and, you know, daisy chain multiple jobs, I would really suggest our alkaline brewery wash. The big difference between that and the products that is mentioned that our competitors is there's no active oxygen. There's no, there's no percarbonate in the alkaline brew wash. So what that means for you on a practical level is you can mix it up in any water temperature. It can be cold water or hot water. There's no temperature requirement to dissolve the cleaner. You're always going to clean a little faster in hot water than cold water, but the nice thing about the alkaline wash is you can mix it up in 100-degree water. A few hours later, it's down to room temperature. It's still going to be just as effective and just as strong as the minute you mixed it up. Nothing's dissipating out in the atmosphere as it slowly releases oxygen gas. So if you're someone that's going to clean, like, say, 12 corny kegs in a day uh, and just want to daisy chain it back and forth and up and down, 
Uh, the alkaline wash, I think, is a better cleaner for doing that type of cleaning. It, it's funny you mentioned that. I actually did clean six corny kegs in a single day uh, just this <laughs> last week. So, um, nice. yeah, that was my my solution was just to make one gallon batches in each of the kegs and kind of uh, use it that way. But you know that this is one of those things that there's a practical reason for my asking the question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you should get one of those, uh, Mark's keg washers or build your own keg washer where you can just, uh, you know, make a gallon of solution and recirculate it. And uh, I've actually talked mm -hmm. to Mark, the guy that makes Mark's keg washer. Um, and he loves our alkaline brewery wash because there's no external heating element uh, for the recirculating pump and the Mark's keg washer. And so there's a lot right. of people that want to have a piping hot cleaning solution that would either jerry-rig external heating elements into that reservoir or, or make a solution so hot that it would actually melt the pump. And uh, to offer a cleaner that doesn't have any temperature requirements that can work in cold or hot water uh, for hours and hours, uh, he actually really enjoys our alkaline brewery wash uh, in his keg washer as the manufacturer of the product. Yeah, if you're talking about doing like, you know, a bunch of kegs all in a row, you make up a gallon of cleaner and then just swap it on the on the keg washer down and down and down and you only have to make like a gallon of cleaner <laughs> and it just keeps on going for you yeah that's pretty fantastic i mean my my usual mo when it comes to cleaning is i don't like to do it i don't enjoy it so i'm going to do as much as i can whenever i can bring myself to do it and just hopefully try to get rid of uh, as much you know as many fermenters and as many bottles that need cleaning and or you know label remover or whatever uh, Mm -hmm. um, that's a that's a great point that you know anything that can last long term without a temperature differential is a, a really viable product. Yeah, give it a shot. You like it? <laughs> I, uh, I, think I will. you know, uh, Jonathan, I'm the old man of the bunch here, and if you go back and listen to some of the er some of the earlier shows when I first started into this whole brewing thing, this whole mead making thing. I was pretty mm -hmm. anal about cleaning and sanitizing and everything. Mm -hmm. and, I, and let me tell you something. All right, in the early days, you could have performed heart surgery on my kitchen counter. Okay, that's <laughs> a, I mean my I mean the floors, the walls, the kitchen counters got sanitized. I mean everything. I was so scared to death of introducing some <laughs> like typhoid in my freaking brew. Okay, I didn't want to <laughs> affect the neighborhood. So you know, so this whole cleaning and sanitizing thing means a lot to me. Uh, we had one of our former co-hosts was actually a surgeon. And wow. Ryan actually uh, kind of alluded to one of the questions that I wanted to ask you about rotating sanitizers. Now, in, in hospital operating rooms, apparently that's a, you know, a standard operating procedure. They rotate their... Uh, their sanitizing, uh, uh, you know, uh, chemicals, uh, apparently. Uh, I, I oh, don't okay. And so, uh, but you're saying for the home brewer, uh, we, we really shouldn't be that concerned about bacterias and things forming that, uh, you know, we would have to, ha because honestly, I, I would like to stick to something that works really good and really and well uh and does the job and that should be my end you know i don't want to buy anything else you know what i mean yeah no i i hear you 100 percent. and uh you know technically if you want to really get down to the nuts and bolts of it there's no requirement that any home brewer has to clean or sanitize anything yeah. um uh, i mean and that's where it gets a little scary because you don't oh, yeah. find anything you have to do um, you know, once you get into the, uh, the professional world, there are requirements for cleaning and sanitizing. Yeah. Um, no, so that's why I think it's important to choose products that you're comfortable working with that are, that are safe, that aren't going to be corrosive and, uh, burn up your skin and hands. And, uh, that's where I think that, I mean, I'll, I'll plug the company I work for. I mean, the products that we make are very safe to use that are highly effective. Uh, and yeah. I think it strikes a good balance between use, being user friendly, versatile, highly effective, and getting the job done. And uh, you know, throughout the years, I've used a variety of products. Like you know, back in the bio, I mean, I've been homebrewing and making mead and wine and beer, cider, uh, kombucha. Uh, I've made uh, Korean distilled beverages, rice wines, sake, all kinds of things. Yeah. And 
Um, you know, I, I stick to two cleaning products. I use our alkaline brewery wash, and I use BTF iota for it. Yeah, I've been using those products since before I started working for National Chemicals. Well, I, you okay. know, I, I was going to ask you, okay, one of the lead-ins that Ryan was going through your resume, uh, 10 years in the fine dining kitchen experience. I hope that wasn't mm -hmm. at the dishwasher, was it? <laughs> no, 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 no. I, um, I, I, work, uh, I spent uh, six of those 10 years working for a restaurant called Sanford in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, uh, under the uh, mentorage of uh, Sandy mm -hmm. D'Amato is the owner of the place. And uh, uh, <laughs> Sandy is a James Beard Foundation Best Chef Midwest oh, yeah. award winner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, actually, I spent three of those six years as Sandy's seafood chef. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. Sandy, uh, Sandy also won a gold medal at the International Boku Store Seafood Competition, etching out Bobby Flay for the gold. Uh, oh, uh, wow. Uh, <laughs> he beat Bobby Flay. Oh, my God. Uh, yeah, so it was it was pretty cool. Hey, so I, I was I was this guy's seafood chef, uh, so that that's part of my restaurant background. <laughs> Outstanding. <laughs> hey, one one one. You know, let me let me get to this, Ryan, before you before yeah, you. Yeah, go ahead, uh, JD. Yeah, one legitimate question that I have that Ryan didn't steal from me. I've got two <laughs> kegerators here in the house. One's one's a four tap, the other one's a single tap. Uh, I, I, you know, I find myself constantly cleaning beer lines because I mean, you know, the neighbors line up at the door with their empty glasses. What's in keg number one this week? Uh, you know, so I'm, I'm always cleaning out, uh, beer lines and stuff. Uh, what product do you recommend and for how long do you, you now, I, you know, I'm, I, I, well, I'll, I'll mention it. I use PBW. Okay. And mm -hmm. I, I pump it through my beer line for like 10 minutes. Uh, okay. Is there a product that you guys offer that does the same thing uh, uh, that can be absolutely used? Absolutely, yes. Yep. Um, yeah. uh, now, how are you cleaning your beer lines? Do you actually have like a recirculating pump where you can cycle yes. the cleaner around? Yes. I, um, I, yeah. Yeah. It recirculates. Oh, that, that's a good way to do it. Yep. yep. Uh, and that mechanical action is wonderful for cleaning beer lines. There's two ways to clean beer lines. One is what's called a static pot. Uh, for the home brewer, a static pot would be you take an empty corny keg, make a, a gallon or two of cleaning solution, you pressurize it, you pour it into the beer line, you hold that solution in the line without any mechanical action for about 15 to 20 minutes, mm. and then you follow that up with a water rinse to flush out a cleaning solution. Now, what you're referring to is recirculating cleaning. Right. Uh, the, re the recirculation gives you that good mechanical action between the cleaner and the soils in your beer lines. Now, for us, what I would suggest um, is uh, uh, our BLC, uh, the beverage system cleaner, the one I talked about a little earlier that we developed with Anheuser-Busch about 50 years ago. Um, it's actually going to be a, what we call a, a, a caustic as opposed to a non-caustic cleaner. So caustic, when you're talking from a chemical manufacturer, what caustic means is you have a chemical strong enough, energetic enough, that it can actually burn or damage your skin or hands or tissue. Right. Now, uh, it makes it dangerous for you to use, but it also makes it highly effective for cleaning beer lines. Uh, so uh, I would suggest actually to pick up a bottle of our BLC. Um, you only need a, a half ounce per every quart of water, so that means two ounces per gallon of water. Yeah. Uh, any water temperature, I usually use about 80 to 100 degrees. Um, if you've been cleaning your lines of PVW, I think you'll notice an immediate difference. Uh, they'll probably push out a bunch of crud that you never knew was there. Oh wow! Um, and that's safe and, enough to run through uh, run through the uh, spigots themselves. Uh, yes, the correct. Ca so uh, the caustic now, isn't going to affect any. I mean, you know, I, I don't want to mention any product names that that I'm. I, uh, well, go ahead. I mean, I'm run, running through the spigots themselves. Now, I mean, there's all different manufacturers of different spigots, and they're made of different materials. Uh, yep. The ones that I use are stainless steel. Perfect. Yeah, stainless yeah. is perfectly fine. The stainless is preferred uh, because it's non-reactive. Now, where you may have some issues using a caustic cleaner is with chrome-plated brass. If it's still chrome-plated, it's fine. Yeah. If you get down to the level in the shanks and the faucets where you're dealing with potentially some exposed brass, mm -hmm. that's where you can potentially leach that into the beverage system and uh, get a metallic flavor in your beverage lines. Yeah. 
So it, it's part of visual inspection. If you do have chrome plated brass in your in your, and it's it's a pretty common option for the home user. It's falling rapidly out of fashion for the last couple of decades in the commercial world. Uh, most modern, if not all modern, commercial beverage dispense equipment is stainless steel. Um, but if you still have uh, some chrome plated brass shanks and faucets, you just want to visually make sure that that chrome plating is still there because that's going to be uh, more of a protectant layer from the cleaning solutions. Yeah. If you've got some exposed brass in your system, you may want to consider replacing that with some good stainless steel um, and certainly be cautious with using a caustic cleaner there. Good, uh, good info. Good info. Uh, okay, yeah, because a lot of us out there have, you know, even for mead makers, uh, that you know they they'll they'll keg their meads up and put it through a a, a, a kegerator too. So Ryan, uh, oh, sure. I, cut, I cut you off, bud. Uh, go ahead, man. Yeah, you know, a question that I had um, I was going to make. First of all, I was going to make a joke about your seafood because I was working on a project uh, a while back with. Um, Red Hook, and uh, we were throwing whole lobsters into the into the fermenter. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> oh no! Oh wow! <laughs> um, but then I was going to say, uh, so along the lines of Jeff's question about how long is that is that cleaner effective? You know, a lot another question that that we see a lot that people uh talk about is saying you know they like mixing up a you know their sanitizer like they like mixing up their sanitizer mm -hmm. and then you know putting some of it in a squirt bottle or putting a top on it or something and keeping it around uh for you know if they need to sanitize their when they degas or when they uh, things like that sanitize their wand or something, um, so so along the same lines of how effective is the cleaner uh, after it's mixed up? Um, how effective is that sanitizer? If I if I you know sanitize my my fermenter and then I you know put uh, you know fill up my squirt bottle with it and keep my squirt bottle around you know for a few days while I'm I'm kind of doing my, my daily degassing of my, of my wine or my meat. Um, once again, that's a very good question, and it's a very common one with sanitizers. Um, but iodine, iodine and on the elemental level is a gas. Uh, it, it naturally wants to become a gas. Um, when we make uh, iota for sanitizers, we work with a, uh, a base that is made from an iodine-based salt that then is gone through a bunch of blending processes to get a physically dissolved iodine aqueous solution. Now, whenever you see that iodine solution, it's always got kind of that amberish-brownish color. Um, that visual cue that uh, it tells you that you've got iodine in solution. Now, the thing is, like I said about iodine, is that over time, well, gas off into the atmosphere because that's what it wants to do. That's where it's happiest. Um, if you mix an iota force solution to the instructions uh, mentioned earlier and just leave it in an open bucket and come back in about 24 hours, you'll likely have clear water. Now, if you take some of that solution and put it into a spray bottle and put a cap on it, seal it up pretty airtight and keep it in the dark away from sunlight, you may be able to, be able to get that solution to last for a few days. Uh, but like I said, just because of the nature of iodine, it will go back out into the atmosphere. And if you notice your solution is clear, you probably don't have an effective sanitizer solution. You can always check the concentration of a BTF iota form solution with an iodine test strip. And that'll tell you with a couple of different color gradients if you've got a 12.5 or a 25 or a greater ppm solution. Now, I know that is something that you can technically do with star sand. Um, and uh, I'm not the manufacturer of Star Sand, so I can't speak to how you technically test the active level of sanitizer in Star Sand, but that's a product that can technically, uh, in my understanding, last a little longer in a spray bottle uh, and have it around for quite some time. Now, if you take the cost of a batch of sanitizer, a half ounce or an ounce of chemical, stacked up against the cost of a batch and your time spent to keep that stuff nice and high quality and sanitized, I, I personally always mix a fresh sanitizer whenever I have a job to do. 
So if I'm degassing, there's a real small usage rate for iodophore. Um, gallon and a half of water, teaspoon of iodophore concentrate. You're making a little over a gallon of sanitizer. Mm. And that's something I know on the spot is going to be 100% effective, measured to the T, uh, if I've got small jobs to do like bottling or degassing or you know, dipping some hand parts in there. And it takes just a moment to mix up. Uh, so that's, that's always my go-to. Let's, uh, guys, before we go on, let's, let's do this. Hey, uh, I need to do this read before we go on. Hey, yeah, uh, bootleg biology. It's an open source yeast and wild bugs project whose goal is to create the most diverse library of microbes for the creation of fermented foods and beverages. All microbes are sourced and isolated from bootleg sources such as backyard orchards, kombucha, yogurt, honey, fruit, bottled dregs, and whatever else they can find to get their hands on. Bootleg biology is the first organization to pioneer the collection and cultivation of official yeast strains for every U.S. postal code and country across the globe. And to further their mission, expand their library, they created the Backyard Yeast Wrangling Toolkit, which includes everything the experimental home brewer needs to use uh, to capture wild bugs, create agar plates, and w isolate uh, wild leaves. For a list of available yeasts and more on the Backyard Yeast Wrangling Toolkit, go to bootlegbiology.com. And hey, bootleg, hey, thanks for supporting the 2019 Iron Bee. Had to get that in, guys. Um, you know, I, I feel that we could go on and on and on and on and on with Jonathan. Uh, Ryan, <laughs> you call it, bud. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I was going to say, based on that read you just did there, I, I say it's, uh, it's probably just as important to have, uh, good sanitized equipment when if you're going to, if you want to use bugs, um, anyway, as opposed to, you know, just doing a, a clean or, a, you know, a sack fermentation. Yeah. Uh, I guess any, I guess Two parting, two parting questions for you, Jonathan, and then we'll let you go. Um, okay. Number one, do you want to you want to mention anything about if you're starting out and you want to do a um, uh, a wild fermentation or a Brett fermentation or uh, TDO or lacto or something? Do you need to start out with just as clean of equipment and sanitized equipment as you would um, as you would with any other fermentation? Number one. And then number two, um, any any final parting tips? Anything we didn't ask you tonight that you think um, uh, the the home, the average everyman, you know, mead maker, brewer uh, should know? Um, and the first question: If even if you're starting a mixed fermentation, always start with a clean slate. I mean, if you have um, uh, you know, let's say the liquid yeast manufacturer makes a blend for you to pitch into the fermentation. You still want that baseline to be as sanitized as possible, so you're not introducing another microbe on top of that desired blend, because that blend of bugs is going to propagate and ferment at a certain ratio that the yeast manufacturer uh, intends. If you're introducing other things on top of that, it's not going to come out the way you may have read about or described from the yeast manufacturer. So even if you're starting out in mixed fermentation, you still want to start clean and sanitized. Um, just because you're making a sour beer doesn't mean you can be lazy with your sanitation. <laughs> um, and uh, that also segues into the, uh, the tips and tricks. Don't be lazy with your cleaning and sanitation. Don't take it for granted. If you drop the spoon on the floor, sanitize it again. Um, cleaning and sanitizing is one of the hallmarks of consistency for making good quality fermented beverages, whether it's beer, wine, or mead, or whatever else, cider. Um, uh, it's, it's one of the bedrocks of getting started well in the hobby. Uh, I know from working on the retail side of things that uh, one of the, in fact, the leading reason people stop doing this type of hobby at home is because they made bad beer or bad mead. And a lot of those bad flavors come from uh, infection. The good news is, is that those infections, nothing's going to hurt you, nothing's going to kill you, nothing's going to make you sick beyond the alcohol that's in there. But if you want to continue to make good, quality, consistent fermentations, sanitizing and cleaning properly uh, are, your, are your friends. There are some other things on top of there, like you know, fermentation temperature control, 
but it all starts with cleaning and sanitizing. Uh, and um, I think it's one of the most important things to learn early on in the heavy because uh, uh, it'll just help you build good habits in the future. Yeah. Excellent. Well, Jonathan, thank you for coming on. This is this episode has been a long time coming, uh, and and uh, we'd love to have you back again to field some more questions uh, for oh, our absolutely. listeners. So we won't keep you any longer tonight. But thank you very much for coming and stopping by. Oh, you're very welcome. I appreciate the time spent here. Um, I hope uh, this is helpful for you guys and uh, your listeners out there. Um, uh, there are ways to get a hold of me at, uh, at National Chemicals if your uh, listeners want to hit me up directly and uh, fire more questions at me. Um, you can always uh, email info at nationalchemicals.com. Um, we've got a Facebook page that I try to keep an eye on. Uh, if you just want to shoot you guys questions, filter them down to me, have me back sometime, I'd be always more than happy to be a resource for you guys. Absolutely. We'll put them in the show notes too, uh, Jonathan. Uh, Great. This was a fantastic episode. Thank you so much. Uh, and the next time we have you on, I want to know more about your home brewing experience and what you like to brew. So, hey, that's sure. For, I got some stories. <laughs> yeah, hey, that's for <laughs> next time. Hey, uh, Jonathan, uh, thank you so much, man. Take it easy, guys. Have a great evening. All right. This is a segment long time coming. Uh, Agreed. this is, this is something that, you know, we used to, we, we talked a little bit about it in the er, very, very early episodes of the meat house back when we didn't know what the hell we were doing. Uh, you know, but, you know, I mean, uh, and Ash said it best. I mean, I think he kind of brought it to the forefront and if you're a key holder, you can listen to, I think it's episode number two. Uh, or interview number two that I did with Ash Fishbein from South House Meadery, uh, where he talks about fundamentals and you start at the, at the beginning. Okay. Knowing the difference between cleaning and sanitizing Ryan. I mean, that's where it has to start. Absolutely. Yep. It's uh, no matter what you're doing, you got to start with good, clean and sanitized equipment uh and and give yourself that that canvas to work from so uh, yeah we will definitely have to do another segment on, oh, yeah. uh in, in the future to answer some more questions but yeah that's uh i hope everybody has a little bit long of a segment for us and i i hope everybody is taking as much away from it as uh as we are well, for our listeners that, uh, you know, out there, if you're not sitting down with a paper and pencil and taking some notes here, I mean, what an outstanding segment, Jeff, um, you sent me, you, you sent a text out that says, uh, I haven't checked my fire extinguisher once in the four years that I've owned my house. Yeah. <laughs> I, lo I looked at that and I thought, what the hell? Uh, I take my C, but yet I take my CO2 cylinder to a fire extinguisher shop to get it filled. <laughs> so, hey, you know, it's all yours, man. Take it away. Sure. And this this kind of dovetails with cleaning. It kind of doesn't. But I, what I want to talk about is just maintenance and getting things set up and, and just the, the regular tasks because I was cooking this weekend and I, granted, I didn't need the fire extinguisher, but... Um, you know, I got a boil over on a pot of some pasta that I was working on, and it, this reminded me of so many times doing like the extract uh, kits, where you've got that hot wort that boils over and it starts to to smoke and smolder on the burners, and you get that nasty smell in the house. Um, there's not a lot of risk of fire in the the uh, yeah. the brew house. Um, I think the biggest risk is probably like when I'm doing a brew outside with my big propane burner. Um, and right. maybe I haven't raked as much as I should have, so there's dry leaves blowing around. Um, still not a huge risk. But it occurred to me, though, I, at some point while I was cooking, that I haven't checked my fire extinguisher in a really long time. <laughs> and, you know, from from a background perspective, I've been renting apartments probably since age 19 and bought my first house right after I turned 34. So I had a long time to establish some really bad habits. Yeah. And around here, um, there's 
I think there's a a, uh, a requirement by law that the landlord has to to have somebody come and certify yep. a fire extinguisher in the apartment every year. Yeah. Uh, because I, I know I've gotten notes and said, you know, lock up your dog because blah, blah, blah. Um, I bought my first house four years ago uh, next month. <laughs> and yeah. I know there's a fire extinguisher under the, the, the kitchen sink. Um, I'll be damned if I haven't checked it. Um, I haven't needed it in all that time. Yeah. And it's kind of one of those out of sight, out of mind things. Um, it, it's probably a really smart idea to have a fire extinguisher around, especially using that big propane burner, just because you never know what could happen. Um, it's one of those things you want to have it on hand. And that kind of got me thinking um, as far as, as maintenance goes, you know, there are, if I were running my home brewery like a professional brewery where they had to have, you know, these, uh, a, like a maintenance schedule, what would I put on it? Um, you know, how often do I need to do all these tasks? You know, I've got a stainless steel fermenter, um, and generally every two or three brews, um, I, I clean it out really good and I passivate it with some really concentrated star sand where you build up a, a kind of a, um, uh, a, a resistant coating on the stainless steel to protect it. Um, that's it's just something I started doing, and I don't know if I, I need to do it more often, if I should do it less often, um, but it's just kind of one of those things that I've fallen into out of habit. Um, and it occurs to me that, you know, it's kind of like in that same, you don't have to do it every time, but you should do it, you know, once every X number of days, months, years. Um, there's probably a lot of parts of the brewing process that maybe I haven't been paying attention to. Um, so I, I kind of went through and said, you know, I've got, I've got these, uh, 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 siphon tubes and things like that, that I use for like the auto siphon to get from fermenter yeah. to keg or what have you, uh, or fermenter to carboy moving between, um, between places. How often do I change those? And I don't really change those according to a schedule. I think the more I look at it, I, I kind of go, well, those tubes, this one looks funky. I should probably replace it. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I clean it with PBW. Yeah, there's stuff or, growing uh, on the inside. What? Maybe I should replace that tube. Yeah. yeah. It, it looks a little cloudy. I should yeah. get going. And, you know, the more serious I get about this, uh, the more I'm investing in better equipment. One of the things I, you know, we, we talked about the, uh, that brew siphon, the, uh, yeah. stainless steel, uh, auto siphon. I love um, it. Yeah. Now that I'm using, and now that I'm using that, I'm, I'm using uh, high temperature silicon instead of the, like, I think it's vinyl, yeah. uh, that, you know, you usually get at the home brew store that's clear. The silicon is cloudy. Well, how the hell do I know when, how often do I need What's, to replace that? Yeah, exactly. I used to go by, it's starting to turn cloudy. I need to replace it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and then you notice stuff craw crawling out the other end when you pick it up to go use it. <laughs> it's like, what are, well, what are, hope it doesn't get to that. <laughs> what, are, <laughs> what are these eight-legged things crawling out the other end of my my sight? <laughs> uh, you know, you got yeah, a point so I there. Guess I, 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 I wanted to throw this idea out to you guys. Do you guys have a, a set schedule for when you do kind of this uh, – with longer form maintenance, do you guys have any thoughts about setting up kind of a, uh, you know, a, a schedule, so to speak, for your own brew house as far as, you know, the, the longer term maintenance you need to do? Um, what, what do you guys think about that? Yeah, every time I brew, uh, <laughs> there's no, I mean, there's no, I don't have a calendar of events that dictate my brewing. Uh, it's just whatever, you know, whatever I feel like brewing. Um, but, I, you know how anal I am about cleanliness. I mean, come on. It goes all the way mm -hmm. back to the beginning of the show. So, uh, every time I get a fermenter, I mean, I got the twins, okay, Buffy and Joey. All right. They sit by side by side on this little brew cabinet that I built. Uh, and, you know, when I go to use either one, Buffy or Joey, okay, they get a full cleaning. I mean, they get PBW. I get a fresh sponge. Now, mind you, this is how anal I still am. Okay, I use a fresh sponge to clean out the the uh, the fermenter with PBW, and then I throw mm -hmm. the sponge away. 
Okay. I don't ever <laughs> use it again. I throw it away. All right. Then I fill it up the full entire seven gallons with the appropriate amount of star sand and I leave it set there for like 20 minutes. Okay. okay I do that. Activating between every, every brain. Every time. Okay, I mean that's still how anal I am. Now I don't sanitize <laughs> the cart, the the you know the 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 countertops. I don't I don't flush the floor with with star sand anymore. I don't spray it on the ceilings anymore. You know I don't I don't go through all that. Uh, but I I am still very leery about you know putting some kind of a bug in something uh that in my brew that i don't want there and so yeah. i'm very i'm very clean uh when i do that i mean now the the you know you brought up a, a good point about that um i just got my uh well i picked it up when i was up in in minnesota last time that uh stainless yeah. steel uh brew siphon outstanding product let me tell you that's the only if you siphon from your from your uh, bucket or or fermenter or whatever you're using, let me tell you something. That's the last auto siphon you will ever need. Uh, but you're right. I mean, you can't see through that silicon tube, uh, that hose. So how do you know no. it's clean? Uh, I mean, I stick it in a in a bucket of PBW and I pump the crap out of it, you know, and I and then I flush it out with clear water after that. And then uh, you know, same thing when I when I you know when I go to use it, I pump some more PBW through it, and I'll pump some star sand through it, let it sit a little bit, you know, before I use it. But um, that's the. Ex I mean, I don't I don't have a schedule, uh, and I'm gonna drop the mic in Ryan's lap here in a minute. I don't have a schedule for doing it. It's just that every time I go to brew something, uh, I'm just an anal about cleanliness i just gotta clean it i gotta clean everything ryan yeah uh, you know it's pretty, pretty similar my my cleaning schedule is around brewing and bottling so before i brew you know i i clean and sanitize the equipment um usually that it's it's put away pretty clean so it's not like i need to do a bunch of scrubbing but i mean you know i clean off the dust and, and that kind of thing and, and sanitize it and then brew. And then when it's time to bottle, you know, I've sanitized all the bottles and then I, am, you know, go into the bottling bucket, you know, from the, from the fermenter into the bottling bucket and into the bottles. And then I uh, clean, you know, the bottling bucket and the fermenter and then take the sanitizer that I had used to um, sanitize the bottles and then sanitize the bottling bucket and the fermenter and then put those away. So, I mean, I'm going to sanitize, I'm going to clean them again and sanitize them again, but I kind of, I, before I use them, I said, when I put them away, they're, they're pretty clean and I've run the sanitizer through them just because yeah. I have it there. So I put it away clean and sanitized. And then before I use it, you know, I, I clean it and sanitize it again um cuz you know it needs it again but that's that's kind of my routine of of how i handle it and that's i i don't do you know much if i'm not if i'm not doing a, a brew or a bottling day it's not a brew day or a bottle day i'm not uh i'm not doing something else you know i've got the two kegerators here in the house that was that was a, that was kind of an important question i wanted to ask jonathan when, when you know in that last segment um because every, every time I I change kegs, uh, you know, I clean the beer lines. I mean, uh, I disassemble the uh, the spigots, uh, and uh, I put them through PBW. I got these little uh, these little brushes, uh, you know, that I can run through the the openings and everything, and I scrub them out real good. Uh, I let them soak in some some sanitizing uh, liquid uh, for a time, uh, and then I, when I reassemble them, uh, well, of course, this is after I run the uh, the uh, PBW through the line itself, and I've got it's a recirculating 
I mean, it's a little simple setup. I mean, all you need is a real little submersible pump uh, and all the connections. I mean, I, I don't want to run through the whole thing here, but, um, I, you know, it's just a recirculating system. And so, you know, I mix up a little one-gallon bucket of, of, uh, of cleaner of PBW, and it just circulates. I let it circulate for like 10 minutes. And then I disassemble the faucet and then put that through a, a PBW bucket with, you know, and take my little brushes and, and, and brush everything off and then sanitize and then reassemble everything. Uh, so I'm, 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 you know, I mean, I'm big on the cleanliness thing. Uh, I think that's very important because I share a lot of my stuff with the neighbors. I mean, you know, we'll sit outside at the table and, and, you know, have a couple of glasses of, you know, brew, whatever I got in a keg or whatever. Uh, you know, and, uh, I, I'm just, I'm still scared to death of, you know, sending somebody home with something that, you know, they're going to wake up in the morning and puke their guts out knowing that the only thing they had to drink or eat that night was, well, what was in Webb's homebrew? <laughs> you know? So, <laughs> you know, so Jeff, I'm just, you know, I'm kind of anal by that. I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm kind of a clean freak, I guess. Well, and here's a, a kind of a tangent off of that thought. That's not necessarily cleaning, but is more maintenance. How often do you take apart like the poppets on your kegs mm -hmm. and check the, you know, the, the little uh, O rings and things like yep. that, either on the poppets good themselves point. or good on those point. tubes? Yep, good point. Because yeah. I noticed uh, I, I was, you know, doing a big spring clean in the fall, summer, yeah, I'm late um, on all my kegs, and. I had a keg that was not holding pressure right, and right. it was really infuriating because, you know, I, I go to uh, pressurize it and pour myself a pint a couple of days later, and it's flat. And I know I had plenty of pressure in there. I just burst carved it. Yeah. Um, I, I pulled that out, and the O-ring around the little uh, the gas inlet dip tube, um, it, it looked like a tire that had ridden through one of those little <laughs> yeah. police spikes. It just tore up all the hell. Um, been there, so done like, well, that, yeah. <laughs> There's your problem, you know. It, it's it's one of those small things that you can kind of just put to one side and not think about every time. But you know, you, you need I think to to schedule. It may maybe you don't check those O rings every last time. Maybe you just you know run your circulator through the keg or you clean out the keg and you move on to batch number two. Yeah. Um, but you know, once every few months, once a year, however is convenient for you. You know, you got to take that thing apart. You got to check it out. You got to make sure everything is in good working order. Replace what's needed. Throw some keg lube on those old parts and stuff like that, and um, just keep everything running properly. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Hey, yeah, uh, let's say, let's end it right there uh, for that segment. Uh, let me get this one in too, and then I think uh, guys, uh, I mean, it'll be up to you too. We got one. I think we got time for one uh, Facebook friend when we get to it. But let me do this first. Hey, in 2009, former archaeologists Nancy and Walter relocated to Vermont where Nancy's passion for local and wild food pushed her canning hobby to the next level. I, hey, you know what? That's right up my alley. I, I just put, put together some, some outstanding strawberry jam today. Uh, jamming and canning, everything in sight, Nancy eventually ran out of fruit and veggies, turning to the covers for inspiration and ingredients, Nancy developed Pot Liquor's signature beer jelly. Now, we had some of this at the 2019 Iron Bee. Let me tell you some good stuff. In 2011, with a cupboard full of canning, Nancy went to the market, and her original beer jelly and other unique flavors caught the attention of food lovers and taste makers across the country, recognized for their excellence. Pot liquor jams have received national awards and international attention. Today, Nancy and the Pot Liquor Kitchen crew can up jams, jellies, pickles, and stove Vermont and distribute them across the country. Shop online if you can't find them locally at potliquorkitchen.com for some jellies and jams that are simply World class. Let me say that again. World class. Potlicker.com. Hey, Nancy and Walter, thanks for supporting the 2019 Iron Bee. Hey, uh, let's see if we can get in a couple of 
at least one Facebook friend. Uh, I've turned to Ryan for this one. Uh, I think Jeff had it last time. I don't remember. Uh, you got anything, Ryan? Right. Yeah, you know, it's not so much a question. It's it's more of just a, a shout out. We'll call it. Sure. Um, Mike let us know that he has restocked his ingredient cupboard. And hope this is from last week, and he hoped to get a couple of batches going this weekend. And he sent a real nice picture of uh, in a, a whole shelf full, a shelf full of Mountain Rose herbs ingredients. Outstanding. So everything from winter spice to yarrow leaves and cinnamon sticks and hawthorn berries uh, and some other stuff I can't quite read here in the back. Uh, maybe cedar berries. It says um, he is just he has got uh, an entire shelf of mountain rose herb stuff, and uh, can't Mike Mike you got a good got a good stockpile there. Can't wait to see uh, what what you make from that. And then one more quick shout out to Julie. And Julie says that she said I already knew she's got a picture here of first place. Uh, in a sweet mead category from uh, Maryland, uh, Maryland State Fair. Um, I already knew that I make great mead, but the endorsement of, of state champion feels pretty awesome too. I'm honestly all, all, not all that modern of a mead maker, probably quite primitive in my process. Staggered nutrient additions are, are about as attentive as I get. I've got four kids and not much attention to spare, but I focus hard on the quality of my ingredients and designing my own recipes because I understand flavor complements and chemistry well. Uh, and she goes from there. So congratulations, yes. Julie, uh, for making some great meads and, and uh, in your own words, being quite primitive about it. I'm sure that Julie always starts with uh, good, clean, and sanitized equipment. Absolutely. And hey, Mike, a, uh, email us, info at themeathouse.com. Let us know what you're making with all those herbs from Mountain Rose Herbs. And Julie, uh, like Ryan said, congratulations. Jeff, uh, just a couple of minutes left. If you got a Reddit uh, uh, friend there, uh, we'd love to hear about it. As Jeff is looking. Yeah. <laughs> looking as a matter of fact, I do have one. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> so this is... Uh, this is probably just a quick one here. It's it, the title is "Help with Carbonation" by uh, Robert H. B. Fourteen um, says. Uh, so I recently bottled a traditional mead with fifteen percent ABV. I wanted carbonation on only a few bottles, so I used five grams of priming sugar per bottle, five hundred ml bottles. And most guides say it should be ready in one to two weeks. It's been almost three weeks. I popped one open, and it had little to no carbonation. It fizzed when it popped, but there are no bubbles. Um, and on the glasses. Is my yeast dead on alcohol content? I don't think I should put more sugar in because the 5 gram rule is for 750 milliliter bottles and it should have more CO2 than normal already. Uh, now he does go on to say in the comments and uh, I, I think this will probably play into the answer, he was using B47 yeast and as we know B47 yeast has a 14% alcohol tolerance. Yep. Um, so, Burn, burned it all uh, up. It, <laughs> Yeah, your, your yeast has probably gone to sleep, I yep. think. And uh, um, the other thing to consider when it comes to carbonating is, you know, bear in mind that alcohol content um, can kind of impede the uh, the carbonation. The more alcohol you have, the, the, the more effort, the harder it is to carbonate, even when you're using forced carbonation. Um, at least that's what I've been told anecdotally. I, I haven't tested that very much myself. Um, but from what I've seen, yeah, it, it does take more effort to, you know, force carb a, you know, a, a massive 12% uh, uh, bracket than it does just an ICD, like going 5 7% hydro. You know what? You're right. I mean, I, you know, some of the high end, the high alcohol bourbon stuff that I've done, bourbon stouts and whatnot, I mean, it's, it's been really hard to get to get the carbonation right on those because of the high alcohol. So uh, I would imagine that's probably a problem he's facing. Ryan, what about using carb drops? Would that, uh, would that help at all? 
You know what I'm talking about. I don't know if it would help if you're gonna if you if you only want to carbonate a handful of bottles. The the carb drops are a really simple way to do it. You know, pre measured yeah. out. Usually it's you know one drop for a 12 ounce bottle, two drops for a bomber, uh, and and it's easy. Um, the other thing to keep in mind too is that when it says you know it should be done in two weeks, you've got to keep an eye on two things. Number one. Do you have uh, enough yeast? Is there enough yeast still in there? Uh, or do you need to add some some bottling yeast or bottle conditioning yeast, you know, afterwards? So if you if your yeast has gone to sleep on you here and you you know, maybe you racked it a bunch of times, you know, you used a fining agent, it's crystal clear, there's probably not a lot of yeast going on in there. Um, you know, you might wanna add uh, say some champagne yeast. You know, and, and yeah. mix up, take portion, and and uh, so you want to do a gallon of it. So you put a gallon in a bottling bucket with some champagne yeast and and the amount of sugar you want to use, or or if you're using carb drops, you know you can just keep those in the bottle and and do that. So making sure you've got the yeast um, right in there, and then secondly is temperature of where those are sitting. So yeah, two weeks yep. if they're at fermentation temperature. Um, longer if they're in the cellar temperature. I've, you know, I've I've carbonated bottle carbonated bottles in the cellar where it took a month, and that's fine. I mean, sometimes it, if you're doing the old fashioned, uh, you know, Ryan high school bolt carbonating, you know, sometimes that takes like three months to get done. So it it, ta- it can take a little longer than that. There's nothing wrong with that based on the style you want to do. Um, but yeah, just those are two quick things to also keep in mind on on uh, mild conditioning. Just to dovetail on Ryan's comment about adding champagne yeast, it occurs to me if he got to fifteen percent on a D forty seven, that's technically a little above alcohol tolerance. So you know, yeah. probably a very well managed ferment. But is he absolutely certain that there are no residual sugars in that mead in the first place? Because that's also going to throw off your carbonation um, sure. uh, calculations there. Yep. You know, those sugars are also open for that the the higher alcohol tolerance yeast to uh, eat. And if that five grams per gallon, sorry, five grams per bottle was based on 750 mils instead of 500 mils, you know, throwing some champagne yeast in there with residual sugar and a little extra sugar, um, we could have bottle bombs there, which True. is something to be really concerned about because that's, that's glass shrapnel. We don't want to deal with that. Yeah, so, that's like that's like uh, little grenades going off around the yeah, depending upon where you storm around the house. Uh yeah, that can be a dangerous situation for sure. Uh hey guys, we're gonna wrap it right there. Uh I tell you what, thanks for listening to all of our uh listeners out there, and special thanks to our guest in this episode, Jonathan Atley from Craftmeister National Chemical. I'll tell you what a segment we had with him. Thanks for hanging out with us tonight. And, hey, don't forget, let us know what you're brewing, and we might even give you a call. Email us at info at themeathouse.com or send us a message on Facebook or Twitter, both at The Mead House. Hey, in the meantime, happy mead making. We'll be back on our regular – we're going to take a couple of weeks off. We'll be on hiatus. And uh, Jeff and Ryan, I see someone's put a couple of buckets of paint and a wheelbarrow full of paint brushes and rollers by the door. Is that some kind of a message or what? But hey, that's it for this episode. Ryan flipped the lights off. Jeff slammed that door shut. We'll be back in two weeks with episode number 137 of The Mead House. We're gone. We're gone.